Welcome to another episode of the Environment in Canada podcast, a podcast about the environment in Canada by Sierra Club Canada. I'm Connor Curtis, Head of Communications at Sierra Club Canada, and today I'm going to be talking with Professor T. Bretel Dawson, an Associate Professor at the University of Carleton's Department of Law and Legal Studies. We're going to be talking about the rights of nature, a concept you might be familiar with from some of our earlier communications, how rights for nature is an increasingly implemented legal system from places like New Zealand to Bangladesh to Quebec, and why it's strange we would assume nature doesn't have rights. Before we begin, just a reminder that you can take action on environmental issues, including the rights of nature, by visiting sierraclub.ca. We have tons of petitions, other actions and events, and regular news updates you can sign up for on the homepage. You can also find Sierra Club Canada on social media, and you can listen to the Environment in Canada podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast also airs on CKUT Broadcast Radio in Montreal, 90.3 FM, bi-weekly on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. ET. Don't forget to click follow or subscribe so you get the latest episodes from us. Thank you for joining me today on the podcast. It's great to be with you. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got involved with work on the rights of nature? Okay, so I was born in New Zealand and I came to Canada in 1983. And I'm a professor at Carleton University in Ottawa in the Department of Law and Legal Studies. So this is a program which focuses on law and society and it's interdisciplinary. But my training is squarely in law. So when I began at the university, I, uh, and really the first time I encountered the rights of nature, it was teaching a course called Private Law. And there were three main components to the course. One was the law of persons, one was the law of property, and one was the law of obligations. And these are uh, fundamental building blocks of the law. Like somebody's even said they're sort of the heart of the semantic architecture of Western legal systems. So, So what the law of persons does is it defines the legal subject, who it is who can is visible in the law, who has legal standing, is capable of holding rights, Mm. and has a legal life, if you will. And then there's property, which is those resources which have been identified as valuable, as things that can be owned, sold, and transferred. And the law of obligations is the doctrines and rights which protect the legal person and property. So it was a blockbuster kind of a course to take on and think about. And those first first materials weren't my own materials. I inherited them in the department, but they included an article by Christopher Stone, the famous uh, article by Christopher Stone, Should Trees Have Legal Standing? Mm -hmm. And Towards Rights for natural objects. It was published in 1972, so it was actually quite recent back then. But he um, it had caused a sensation when it was published. And he had proposed, this is a quote, proposed that we give rights to forests, oceans, rivers, and to other so-called uh, legal objects, indeed to the natural environment as a whole. So uh, he later recalled it as a vague, if heartfelt idea that he'd tossed off in the heat of a lecture and then worked up into an article. It caused a sensation and it was, it got into the hands of nature's justice, Justice Douglas of the Supreme Court of the United States, when it was hearing another famous case, Sierra Club and Morton. And that was a case in which the Sierra Club uh, wanted to object to the development of a ski resort in the Sierra Madre. And the question was, well, did the Sierra Club have the legal standing? Did it have sufficient connection to the area or to the project to raise an objection to the plans of the Forest Service? And the majority of the Supreme Court of the United States said, no, the Sierra Club didn't have a legal standing. But in his dissent, Justice Douglas said, wouldn't it be simpler if we could just bring an action like this that brought together all the fragmented uh, interests of the natural environment, uh, the eagles, the river, uh, in front of the court in its own name. Mm. 
So it would be the Sierra Madre against Morton. So he took the idea seriously. But in my first encounter with that article, it was early in the early in the introductory material, and I formed the opinion that, that it was just there kind of to get students a bit stirred up and that it was really just sort of a bit of a laugh before we settled down into the serious uh, work of the course. I suppose I fit into the category that um, Stone himself identified of people, until you see something as having rights, it's kind of unthinkable. It's ridiculous. And I think a lot of people, when they first encounter the idea that nature has rights or could have rights or could be recognised as being a legal person, first reaction is to say, well, it's just not possible. So I took a, a break from the course a few years later and I taught it and I came back about 15 years ago and so I redeveloped my materials, did some more research in the area and I learned that this idea towards legal standing for the natural environment had taken off. There was a body of jurisprudence called Earth Jurisprudence. Cormac Cullinan had written a book called Wild Law. The idea was being picked up at the local level. Shapley, Maine had passed an ordinance so that the council could push back against or could be required to push back against <clears throat> giving Nestle a permit to draw water from their river. That was the moment when it became real to me. Its transformative potential became real to me. And that's when the rights of nature blew my mind and mm. I've been engaged with it ever since. It's funny because you, you brought up something that I was very much thinking about, which is most of the time when somebody says the word rights, right? Like we have a very kind of common sense idea of what that actually means. And in fact, you know, looking back, I actually did my undergraduate in history and connected to various social movements. And even the idea of rights is not like uh, necessarily as a concept, quote unquote, it's not necessarily like historically, it's it's very fluid, right? Like what mm -hmm. that means. And you go to another period in time, the medieval age, for instance, and, you know, ask people something about rights, they might have very little concept of that in the way that we think about it now. But when we actually look at like the world right now, corporations have rights. I mean, th this is a non person in a, in a sense that has rights. So it's not actually that strange of a concept mm -hmm. legally, it seems, mm -hmm. but it, it is interesting how much individually perhaps we we have we have this concept that rights are are a certain thing and i guess this ties into my second question which is you know for some of our audience who are less familiar with that concept you know what is the 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 core idea you're giving to this is that again a natural space can have can have rights or the i i guess maybe there there's a clarification I, i'd love to dive into which is what does that mean in terms of like if you're then walking past this lake that has that has rights? Okay, okay, so it's a great question. And it, just as you were asking it, I was, and you mentioned medieval times. I was thinking, well, the, one of the core ideas, and it goes back even earlier, was this great chain of being that mm -hmm. somehow put rocks and stones at the very bottom of the order. And you work your way up and it becomes human beings and then it becomes the monarch at the very top. So, so we're very also accustomed to this idea of humans being at the top of the heap and law being for humans, a very anthropocentric way of looking at the world and legal orders. And yes, there have been changes. There's been a, a, a sort of an opening up of who has rights and how they got those rights, which is a kind of foundational when thinking about why it's viable and to think about natural entities as having rights. So a little tutorial then, because you've already said we're familiar with the, in our society, we're familiar with the term rights, right to life, liberty, security of the person, for example. We're also familiar with the idea of capacity and having legal capacity so that we can make decisions that are legally effective, uh, that have to do with ourselves or our property the ability to enter into contracts. So there's this idea of having rights and then having capacities. And it's my training, of course, I think of rights in terms of legal rights. And uh, in the context of the law and in the context of rights, well, somebody has to be able to hold them. Somebody has to have them. Somebody mm -hmm. has to be able to exercise them and find them useful. So 
who are the someones is kind of the question you get to pretty quickly. And you've already pointed it out already that not every entity that holds rights has to be a human being. Mm. And indeed, legal person is a term or a category which is different from human being. So corporations are legal persons, they're jural entities, they're represented in court by lawyers or legal representatives. They can take actions uh, in the best interests of the corporation by the officers of the corporation. So they can be very active, uh, even though they're not even remotely human. And this idea that corporations are legal persons is as much of a mind bender, really, as the idea that rivers could be legal persons or ecosystems could be legal persons. And the only reason why we don't let it blow our minds is because we're so accustomed to it, we're so familiar with it. But when the United States Supreme Court came down with one of its iniquitous decisions, uh, the Citizens United case, they uh, really analogized corporations to uh, to human beings and having rights to free speech and expression. But after that, there was a bit of a there was a perfectly legitimate and appropriate hue and cry from people about how it is that this corporation could have legal existence, how it could have and accumulate so much power and mm. wealth. And there was a movement started in Vermont to um, that corporations aren't legal persons and whatever legal provisions there are that say that they're legal persons should be repealed or or changed. So, but yes, corporations are legal persons. So if you follow the link, the line through that, then it's actually relatively non-controversial that a non-human entity could have legal rights, and that's the that's the that's the platform or the base on which this idea of rights of nature has been built. So what rights of nature is about, is about seeking recognition for natural entities as legal persons or juristic or jural of the law, jural entities with legal rights and legal standing to protect them at the negotiating table with Hydro-Quebec, at the negotiating table if there are development proposals that affect the natural entity. Mm. and But not just at the negotiating table, um, although very importantly this idea of the natural entity having a voice uh, outside of the courtroom as well and that it becomes a member of conversations in its own rights, in its own best interests. Yeah. But if necessary, the river, the mountain, can go to court through its human representatives and uh, seek uh, remedies for a breach of rights or an injunction uh, to stop whatever harmful activity is going on. And, uh, and so... Remedies to receive damages, hold it in a trust fund, and to um, pay it out if somebody else takes uh, the river to court. So kind of there's an architecture or a structure that can be put in place in which rights of nature is about putting in place for natural entities. But at the same time, the rights, I mean, so we're talking about legal rights. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about human rights. Corporations don't have human rights. Rivers don't need or want human rights. They want river rights. So human yeah. rights are about our existence as human beings within our society. Mm. Um, and river rights are about the rights of rivers to be and how it is um, how it how it lives and breathes in its society and its ecosystem. So the right. So then, so that's another kind of barrier you sometimes get. Well, what use is the law for rivers for for the for nature? What use are human rights for rivers? And you can say, well, they're no use at all. And the fact that you're asking that question kind of reflects the idea that the law is anthropocentric and that humans are right at the top of that great chain mm. of being, and only things that matter to humans matter in the law. Um, so what are the river rights then? Well, in the Magpie River in Canada, there was a declaration of river rights. So these would be rights to be free from pollution, to maintain its natural biodiversity and to nurture 
the diversity of life that lives within it and in its uh, in its ecosystem, its catchment or watershed, the right to maintain natural uh, cycles and the right to flow. A number of the rivers where legal personhood has been sought for rivers have been rivers that have been dammed with this redevelopment of dams. And that involves not just the, the government in relation to indigenous peoples, but also uh, corporations and the private sector and private sector uh, rights. So, so river rights, so rights of nature, seeking and seeking recognition of natural entities as uh, legal persons who have standing in the law, who have rights that are appropriate to its existence and its life for rivers, the right to, to flow and be free of pollution and to sustain its biodiversity. And Christopher Stone, he said, he, he responded to some questions. He got, well, why do you have to, why do you have to put it that way? Why do you have to say river rights or legal personhood rights? And, you know, if we go back up the, the sort of the list of the kind of my logic structure, well, there's part of the answer there, that it's familiar. It's about law and legal rights. And it's a really remarkably open-ended and flexible category of who can mm -hmm. get in, uh, who isn't in. And, and its familiarity, I think, first of all, saves us the burden of having to come up with something completely new and also allows us to, to build from an existing foundation. The other thing he said, which is interesting, and this is, you know, I've sort of made these points where it's perfectly normal, it's perfectly possible, it's um, been recognised in law before, and that's kind of the strategy in Rights of Nature to say, nothing to look at here, we're just doing what the law already allows. But there's an also, there is a, another part of rights of nature in relation to legal personhood or recognition of the, um, the animate nature of nature. And that's, it's very transformative. Uh, mm. What Stone said to us nearly 60 years ago was, and here's a quote, a society in which it is stated, however vaguely that rivers have legal rights, would evolve a different legal system than one which did not employ that expression. So by bringing nature in, we begin a transformation process and we begin to knock away the idea of an anthropocentric, humans first uh, mm -hmm. framework of, of analysis and of what the law consists of. And it's raising some questions for me, which are interesting, because it's funny when in the earlier question, I realized I'd, I'd framed things very much from a Western point of view, you know, myself, because that's, well, that's what I did my history degree on. And that's what yeah. mostly, right, was was that viewpoint. But it's also true that, like, this is not a new concept either. And as you're talking about, I mean, the the this paper is uh, 60 years now that this notion that we could be undergoing this transformation, sure. But even before that, for, you know, thousands of years, there are indigenous con concepts that, that reflect this. I mean, you can go back to Europe and you can go back pre-enlightenment and you can find, you know, like belief systems that were not uh, necessarily mm -hmm. anthropocentric, even in Europe. And uh, so it is funny how much we're, you're, you're, you get, you've given a great kind of understanding of what this, this looks like from a legal perspective. But now I have all these questions that have come <laughs> to mind because I'm going, yeah, actually, in some ways we're, we're, we're not having to understand something that's necessarily like should be hard to understand. It seems to be actually more fundamental. And in a weird way, the way we look at legality and rights now is a construct we've created in very a very, very recent period. That's right. And I, I also like just the idea of communications, right? Like for me, that that's my background. I, I work in communications, not law. So the idea that by acknowledging the rights of nature, now I'm having a conversation not only between say, people who live next to a natural uh, environment, but also with the environment itself is, uh, yeah, it's something I'm going to have to go home and, and spend think a lot of time yeah. thinking yeah. about. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, you have raised a, a, a very important point that sort of in the middle of the, uh, the sort of the sort of six, six, 17th century, 18th century, there was a big change in the way in which law was framed, and that was the 
that was the sort of the moment of the English Enlightenment, the European Enlightenment, the 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 final decline of feudalism, uh, yeah. and so you know there were some new ideas that the the individual democracy rather than the monarch of trying to keep the state out of everybody's business so so a very strong push towards that and and kind of that's become the foundation for what I think it, it suited the industrial and grew out of the industrial revolutions as well so it fostered mm. the sort of economic model that we've got now which you know in a Extremely short period of time when you think of how long our planet has been here. What is it? 250, 300, 350 years has brought us to the very brink in terms of sustainability of life systems because of the 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 damage that an industrial economy and a legal system which is built around sustaining or supporting that kind of industrial economy, the corporation as an individual. It's it's just less than a blink of an eye. Uh, huge amounts of inequality that have developed. The period of colonization, decimation, the disaster for uh, indigenous peoples with uh, the arrival of European nations. I, I was going to say, often indigenous people still to this day leading on this concept, as I understand it, and Absolutely. and you know, often leading the charge to have the rights of nature recognized. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, gosh, where to, where to start, though? Um, so if we can just sort of circle back a sec. Sure, yeah. Right? So, so I just sort of want to mention some of the ideas that are part of rights of nature thinking. Um, sure. It's, it's not just about rights, but they're more fundamental ideas, and they, by and large, come from indigenous legal orders and governance orders and ethical orders as well. Yeah. Um, but the the idea that nature is animate and alive, the legal system that we've we developed with the advent of the industrial economy, thought of uh, nature as dead as inanimate, as a thing, infinitely fungible, not having any inherent uh, characteristics or life force. So, so rights of nature takes on board the idea that nature is animate and alive. There was also and, and that nature and humans, and indeed nature and humans and other living species are in an integral relationship with one another. They're not separate. Our legal system has tend to, and it's the structure of persons and property. Mm. Persons think of nature as something external to them, as mm. other, and with the great potentiality of being property, uh, something which yeah. can be owned and exploited and turned into commodities. So, so, so these ideas that nature is animated and alive, that uh, nature and humans aren't separate but integrated together, these are transformational ideas uh, within rights of nature as well. Um, another idea um, that sort of is it, just that you've mentioned the, sort of the historical perspectives and in feudalism, the private property didn't really exist. It was would, be, it would have been a very hard concept to grasp. Even farming, a lot of farming was done on strips of land, which required collaboration between different farmers. But that the obligation of stewardship wasn't about ownership, but it was about stewardship of, of land and of nature mm. um, and even the existence of the commons as a, as a reservoir of life and health. So another idea that's part of this rights of nature thinking is that reflects indigenous ways of being and knowing is this idea that nature is abundant. What what our Western way of thinking has done is to say, oh, well, nature's scarce. So we have to have this system of allocating access and control and decision making. We need to cut up nature into these blocks that can be owned because there's not enough to go around. And Robin Kimmerer, of course, has said, well, that's actually a construct Scarcity is a construct. It um, wasn't a fact or an empirical reality. But the idea is that if given the chance, 
the earth will is bursting with life and capacity for regeneration. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that idea of somehow changing the legal structure which has been imposed on top of the earth is core to rights of nature to remove the agents of destruction pollution and emissions that have 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 created real conditions of scarcity and risk and have done nothing at all uh, to um, to protect or enhance the world we live in so yes. so um so so those ideas Kind of where do we get those ideas from now? Uh, well, some from history, uh, European history, but some, I think, from indigenous ways of knowing and being, for sure. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious, uh, you know, you you touched on this a little bit earlier with the Magpie River, for instance, but mm-hmm. are there cases where the rights of nature have already been applied and how was this achieved? What What brought it from point A to point B? Okay, well, great. Yes, there's tons happening, and it's pretty exciting. Uh, and there are four four approaches that have been used, some with more success than others. So I'll start off with um, constitutional change. So Ecuador, Bolivia um, have changed their constitutions to recognize Mother Nature, nature as uh, a being in the life of Ecuadorians and Bolivians. So uh, that wouldn't happen in Canada. Um, we can't change our constitution all that easily. But it's a constitutional change. Um, another has been going to court. Mm. And this is different than the climate change litigation by youth in which they're claiming human rights to a livable planet, uh, right. right? But this is where challenges, of cases have gone to court to say uh, rivers should be recognised as legal persons primarily. So Bangladesh in Principal courts have declared that all rivers in Bangladesh are legal persons. That the Columbia Arato Arato River is a, a legal person through uh, court decisions, decisions of judges. What judges are doing there is they're drawing on an ancient jurisdiction of courts and judges uh, to pr- take care of the vulnerable. Uh, so the vulnerability here is the, the vulnerable, the river that's vulnerable to to damage from human actions. There was a the river Ganges as well in India. There was a, a decision by a judge in the High Court of India to recognise or say that uh, the Ganges was a legal person. But that got you know the High Court stayed that ruling, and and courts aren't all that well situated to go into the the nitty gritty of how it could work and how it would work if nature was a legal person. Mm-hmm. What, 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 what I think rights of nature uh, thinkers and activists want is for courts to recognise legal personhood when it's brought to them through a couple of other means that have been used. So, so one of the uh, ways that it's been used most notably, and I would argue kind of s- successfully in a transformational way, has been in New Zealand. So when I say at the beginning of our conversation, I grew up in New Zealand. I mean, I sort of have a watching brief uh, about New Zealand. And uh, so I was delighted to learn (laughs) uh, that uh, there had been innovations in New Zealand. So there are two, about to be three, uh, natural entities, elements of nature that have been declared or recognised through legislation from a national parliament as legal persons and mm. having all the rights and capacities of legal persons. So so the first time was the, um, the Te Uawera. It's a wilderness area. It's an ecosystem. It has been or was a national park. Uh, it's also the traditional lands of an indigenous nation. So that was uh, recognised in 2014 as a legal person. It uh, was no longer a national park and a new system of representation and management of the uh, of the, the area was uh, introduced. Uh, in 2017, uh, the Whanganui River, which is one of New Zealand's longest rivers, sort of between Auckland and Hamilton, sort of actually, it kind of rises in Hamilton, which is south of Auckland, and winds its way 300 kilometres south to the city of Whanganui. So that was recognised as a legal person in legislation. Um, uh, and the legislation sets out uh, how that 
will work. And it also has a very, uh, and, and, and the same in the Te Uawera situation, a very eloquent and beautiful way of framing the relationship of the Indigenous people of the Maori of those areas, their relationship with the river, uh, with the ecosystem. And um, there's currently a proposal uh, um, for Mount Taranaki to be seen as a legal person. And again, Mount Taranaki used to be called Mount Egmont after a governor general appointed by the colonial government in uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, was became Tar Taranaki National Park. And a, and a mountain like it's kind of like Mount Fuji. So it's one of these cylindrical volcanic uh, mountains. And it has snow. The snow comes down in rivers. It's uh, cyclical. It sustains an enormous ecosystem, the Taranaki Plains. So it's a mountain. It's sacred to uh, the Maori in the area, an unbroken relationship uh, between the mountain and the people. In fact, in relation to the river, it's right in the legislation. I am the river. The river is me. There is, there's no separation between the people and mm. the the river uh, or the ecosystem. So those are um, those are three examples where this has been done. And again, you, you sort of raised the point about sources or inspirations from indigenous ways of being and ordering. Well, these three examples in New Zealand were absolutely initiated by indigenous people and grounded in Indigenous cosmology, ways of seeing and being in the world. And they were part of settling breaches of New Zealand's founding treaty, the Treaty of Waitangi, which, as in Canada, you know, set out, you know, sort of said Britain can have some sovereignty, but there are continuing um, rights and, uh, of Indigenous uh, peoples in New Zealand. But, well... As in Canada, those grand hopes, on, certainly on the Indigenous side, that it would be possible to integrate and manage these new people uh, who were coming in uh, by the boatload, were, were, they were very soon dispelled. There was war, there was uh, confiscations of land, uh, horrific attacks, uh, deprivations, exclusions uh, of Indigenous people from their their place of being. Um, and in fact, even in Canada with national parks, uh, to found national parks in this country, it was, you know, there were supposed to be these, you know, these, these uh, wilderness, people-free world. There's a history there that we, we've we recently, we've documented on our website where we talk about the early Sierra, granted uh, the US Sierra Club, but still uh, an organization from which we take our name by being a, a legally separate entity and an organization that we work with, you know, and they, they too have had to, you know, talk about what, what is the history of this advocating for national parks and treating those spaces as if nobody was there. And then the people who were in fact there and did in fact know that often being forced either to vacate or to take on roles within a park system that like, deeply offensive and harmful in, in, in the long run. So, yeah, no, no. Can, can, right. Yeah, I was in Canada as well, Banff National yes. Park, Riding National yeah. Park. Um, the, their housing shelters were destroyed. Um, uh, they were gone. Uh, and, you know, the Canada, the National Park Canada, what is the organisation in Canada? Oh, um, let's say Parks Canada, there it is. Right, yeah. Parks Canada has uh, um, has has begun to fundamentally change its uh, relationship with Indigenous peoples, given that background. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, so New Zealand legislation um, grounded in Indigenous claims uh, for restoration and reconciliation and, frankly, uh, indigenization of their territories, um, the removal of Western law, uh, is not far behind in in the thinking of uh, these settlements. And, you know, Jacinda Ruru, who was uh, part of the uh, Te Uwarera and the uh, Whanganui River, um, she had read Christopher Stone. The government negotiators had read Christopher Stone. They got to a stalemate. How are they going to get through it? Well, the idea was that 
<clears throat> legal personhood became a very a, an easy way to actually stop talking about who owned what, because the river or the ecosystem is the legal person, mm -hmm. and it it there's ownership. So it was kind of a way of stepping a, away from that unresolvable question of of ownership and property. Constitutional change, court challenges, legislation, primarily to settle Indigenous claims. And Jacinta Ruru has made the point that this kind of thing, it really needs to be initiated by uh, Indigenous peoples, led by Indigenous peoples. It's an Indigenous-led conservation model. It's not mm -hmm. only conservation. It's also about sustainable use by Indigenous peoples within their territories. And it's consistent with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, about Indigenous peoples reclaiming their territories and how they are governed. So there have been another, there's been another approach, and that's uh, in Canada, a joint declaration between a, a regional municipality in Quebec and the Indigenous nation. That's the Magpie River. Mm -hmm. So it's a local declaration setting out rights. And the hope is that if anything, if Hydro wants to develop some more, that that declaration could be used in court to, to bring a different perspective uh, into play, the perspective of the river. Well, and that's I something heard, I wanted yeah. mm -hmm. to ask you about was like, before we go, because I know we are running out of time, uh, yeah. I wanted to ask very specifically about like, what are some of the on the ground ramifications? What do you see, you know, as a result of the, this, like, what does it change maybe for, for people uh, afterwards? Okay, so it's a standing place. It's a voice of the river at the table. It's a reset and a changing of relationships with the river. Mm -hmm. um, and... <clears throat> Uh, Hydro Quebec has already, I think, indicated uh, that it knows it's time for them to change it to change its relationship with Indigenous people and the resources where it has done the hydroelectric development. Uh, in New Zealand, there are new management structures, and in the Te Uawera, when they first when they did their first sort of management plan, they said, "This is a plan about managing people." people's relationship to this ecosystem it's not about managing the ecosystem and that's mm -hmm. sort of a it's again some of its conceptual shifts but with legal effect uh, if mm -hmm. and when called upon and the uh, ceo of the new uh, body the new kind of corporation if you will that uh, is active in the tea you are aware has said you know we're, we're able to do this so much better through this uh, body than the government in New Zealand's ever been able to do it. They could send maybe three or four conservation officers at a time. But if we need to remove invasive species, we can mobilise 5,000 people who are our people. So a very um, a, a very much more integrated and effective approach to conservation that's locally based and driven by Indigenous people. In Canada, we have Indigenous protected and conserved areas, which are happening at the same time. And there's a common idea between uh, rights of nature, legal personhood, and Indigenous protected and conserved areas. And that's guardianship, uh, involving elders and youth mentorship, getting back to the land, learning the land as the source of law and uh, abundance and being able to thrive as communities and nations. So um, those are those are some of the ways in which there have been practical changes on the ground. Um, mm. In case you had a couple of other things that you wanted to chat about before we go, I just wanted to give okay. uh, we have a couple more minutes left. So, so by all means, go ahead. Okay, great. So when we began to talk, I sort of talked about my initial encounter with Christopher Stone's article and then coming back and seeing, seeing it through new eyes and having it blow my own mind. In my own teaching and thinking over the last 15 years, Rights of Nature has, it, there's been an urgency in my teaching with my students. What, what's an education for on a planet with a biosphere? What's an education for? What's a legal education for in an environment where we're facing pollution, loss of biodiversity, climate breakdown? It's not about producing the same way of thinking or the same way of being among our students and those who go on to law school. So there's been an urgency in my thinking to sort of to to to, to open ways of thinking about our earth and our law and our relationships with it. So to me rights of nature it disrupts and interrupts the paradigm of humans first of western law of legal persons as individuals <clears throat> and of property and commodification of property. Think about it, trees, where it all began, do trees have legal standing? A tree standing in a forest, in an ecosystem, <clears throat> is 
is an entity, it's a being. Think of the kauri trees in New Zealand or the, the redwoods in California, hundreds, thousands of years old, supporting entire ecosystems within one tree. But our Western way of thinking has said a tree, lumber. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the logic of uh, law, of property law, property in forest Kenyas has turned nature into a commodity. And so we have to interrupt uh, that way of thinking about property as well and introduce the idea that 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 the planet, the forest, the tree are habitat. The habitat for all of us and the source in which all life, the source of all life beginning and continuing. So my passion and my teaching has been to interrupt the paradigms of Western law and think about new ways uh, to to think about and act upon this in law. Uh, If you like, the new generation of negotiators uh, uh, in relation to that river or that mountain or that ecosystem. But it's also to me about opening up that space that gets opened with the interruption and bringing in Indigenous ways of knowing and being Indigenous legal orders and Indigenous governance orders, Indigenous mm-hmm. ethics to learn with, to sit with as non-Indigenous people. Um, all of the good ideas about how to how to live on in our habitat are in Indigenous ways of knowing and being and ethical structures already. So uh, if we are that's the, that's where the the space comes from, and and the really encouraging thing is that there are indigenous scholars in Canada who are saying, you know, there's a kind of a new approach, a relational rights of nature, which which draws in uh, all of the little bits and pieces in Canadian law, Section thirty five, Aboriginal rights, envisages a multi societal or a multi multi juridical framework. It's not just one legal system. We know we have civil law and common law, and but there's also Indigenous law. And so Section 35, but Section 35 also envisages that living, these legal orders living together. We've got um, the Canadian law of the legal person, women are legal persons because of the living tree. Trees always fun- figure in these discussions, the living tree of our constitution, which can grow and change over time, open-ended and flexible. So we have a legal tool that we can use as well. And international uh, documents uh, as well uh, allow us to, um, to to pull in other other modalities. So, So the idea is then that we can, in Canada, structure a distinctive rights of nature that builds on all of the threads and connections around uh, law and rights and uh, our habitat here on planet Earth. So I just that, I just thought it would be good to sort of say, well, it's to me, it's it's a it's a has been a passion. So that today's young people, mm. my students, our graduates, uh, we'll have a new toolkit, a new way of thinking. We'll be adept at moving outside of the paradigm that was presented as the only way of thinking and being. That they will be the agents of change as I uh, end my teaching career in the next uh, year or so. Professor Dawson, thank you so much for joining me today. I think it's been a pleasure. Hi, everyone. So we do at the end of these podcasts a quick Q&A to answer questions from listeners. And we just want to clarify before we get into it for this week that the Q&A answers we give don't in any way reflect the views of our guests who join us on the podcast. This is just a response from Sierra Club Canada to to our listeners. And also the subjects don't really uh, tie into the episode because they're usually about previous episodes or, or other subjects. This week, we had somebody ask, what are some of the actual impacts of offshore oil? And it's an interesting question. It's tied very much into a lot of the work that we are doing right now around the impacts of offshore oil and proposed offshore oil projects like Beta Nord off the coast of Newfoundland and Labrador in Canada, but also to some of our international work with other uh, organizations in other countries that are facing offshore oil development and, and trying to figure out ways to prevent it from happening. And simply put, there are a number of different impacts of offshore oil, and it, it kind of varies depending upon 
uh, what we want to talk about. If we're talking about immediate impacts, there are obviously always the risk of spills that can do a lot of damage to uh, local environments, to the, the marine ecosystem in the area, but also to larger scale marine ecosystems at, at the same time. Obviously, an, an oil spill doesn't have a boundary or, or no border. It will flow with ocean currents. And we've, we've seen evidence, in fact, that you know some of the oil projects that we, we are helping to fight elsewhere, these don't necessarily stay within a national border, right? This is something that can can easily spread uh, across multiple places and on a wide area. In Canada, with the Beta Nord oil project, one of the big concerns we've heard from indigenous fisheries in New Brunswick is that they could very much be impacted by this offshore oil project that is over in Newfoundland and Labrador because their salmon population, it could be impacted by that. So again, when we talk about the, the actual impacts of offshore oil directly, we, we definitely are talking about the impacts of a potential spill or whether that's a large spill like a well blowout or smaller spills, but definitely talking about those immediate impacts as one thing. There are the impacts of exploration and, and sonic testing for, for oil, which of course can have impacts on whale populations and, and other species in a given area and are often underestimated by companies, uh, often the risk of a spill too is underestimated by the company in question there are other impacts that of course come with oil and gas which are not just tied to the immediate environmental impacts so a good example of this for instance is looking at the impacts of offshore oil and gas on climate change if we look at this uh, carbon budget that we have there really is no room for oil and gas expansion we've known that for a long time now over a decade in fact that the first research i read uh, came out saying that there was no room for further oil and gas expansion so that's one massive impact of offshore oil is that you know any expansion of offshore oil really doesn't allow us to to meet our carbon budget it also doesn't allow us to meet national emissions targets if we're talking about expanding into new offshore oil uh, projects. Uh, certainly companies have made a lot of claims about reducing localized emissions to projects, but that doesn't really matter because the it's the cumulative total emissions of, of the oil. It's the oil when it's burned that really matters. That's where the vast majority of emissions from oil and gas come from, is from the burning of the oil itself. So whenever you hear labeling like this is green oil, we're going to do green oil in the offshore that's really false. I mean, there, there is no such thing as green oil, that it, even if it has slightly lower emissions at the source, that's not the major source of the emissions. But then there's another a aspect of impacts that we maybe don't talk about as much. You know, definitely there are economic impacts from things like immediate spills, right? We could talk about fisheries being impacted by the risk of an, of an oil spill, in the case of Beta Nord, as high as 16%, a, ch a chance of a serious spill, something that the company vastly under played. Uh, if we want to talk about that, that's one thing. We could also talk about the risk of climate change to things like fisheries and other industries where we see uh, changes in ocean conditions that could very much lead to the collapse of a lot of Atlantic Canadian fisheries. And this is this is a big, a huge problem that it, we are facing right now. And that is worsened with every barrel of oil we extract and burn. There's a a third kind of impact, though, economic impact that we maybe don't talk about as much, and I'm talking about this in, in Newfoundland and Labrador's context, but this context also applies to a lot of other places around the world. Offshore oil is often sold by companies as an economic solution to uh, an area's problems. And in the case of Newfoundland and Labrador, it's sold in terms of jobs, it's sold in terms of economic stability and in terms of revenue. What we're increasingly seeing with oil and gas in general, let alone just uh, offshore oil, is that the benefits to local economies are, are increasingly minimized. The jobs are increasingly minimal. Uh, we definitely see this with, with Beta Nord, that the, the sort of proposed economic impacts that they're saying, the benefits that could come out of it are, don't match with what the project actually even at its, its peak, even if it worked perfectly, would provide. But as well in a world that's rapidly transitioning away from oil and gas, these projects are, are not very viable economically. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that that will stop a company from pursuing them because companies actually don't always make the most economically sound choices. Uh, you know, they are as much of the rim of individuals within the companies themselves thinking something is a good idea as anybody else's. Uh, and in the case of Newfoundland and Labrador, we've had a lot of promises around offshore oil uh, creating some sort of bright future for the province, but there 
there just isn't the economics to, to make that point out. Even without the sort of climate aspect of this, where everybody's shifting away from dependence upon oil and how that prevents this from being a viable project, that is some of the most expensive offshore oil to create. So when these projects are sold to places as a solution for local economics, they really shouldn't be, and they really shouldn't be sold as fixes, because what it does is it not only affects, and we've gone into this in a previous podcast episode on Equinor Out, what it really does is sets unrealistic expectations for people that stops them from doing things like, you know, changing their path in their education or changing or going and getting retraining solutions, right? On an individual level, it means that they might take out things like a mortgage based upon the idea that offshore oil is going to come in and save the day. These are incredibly bad personal impacts that happen when these companies oversell these projects. And in general, oil and gas companies oversell their projects because they know, and they must know at this point, that a lot of these projects are not viable. But from the second they start to talk about the climate risk of their own oil projects, they they make all of the, the industry's oil projects sound less viable. So it is incredibly hard for them as a company to actually come out and be honest and say, oh, this oil and gas project doesn't actually work. So those are sort of the three impacts, if you like. There's the immediate local impacts of exploration for oil and gas and spills. There's the climate impact, which, of course, we, we see in terms of uh, forest fires, extreme weather, but also changing ocean conditions that are a huge threat to fisheries. And then finally, there's the economic aspect of this and the impact it has on local communities. And if you want to find out more, you can find out more about our uh, ongoing legal challenge to Equinor on the Can- and the Canadian government on the approval of Baden Nord that we are pursuing with indigenous communities in New Brunswick. You can also find out uh, more about our participation in the global Equinor Out campaign. Uh, all of this is available on our website. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Environment in Canada podcast. Just a reminder that you can take action on environmental issues like the rights of nature or offshore oil by visiting sierraclub.ca. We have tons of petitions, other actions and events, and regular news updates you can sign up for on the homepage. You can also find Sierra Club Canada on social media, and you can listen to the Environment in Canada podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. The podcast also airs on CKUT Broadcast Radio in Montreal, 90.3 FM, bi-weekly on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. ET. Don't forget to click follow or subscribe so you get the latest episodes from us.